In the midst of everyone being dead, I, the one who was supposed to be humanity's strongest warrior, am also dying. I really don't deserve the title of the strongest warrior because I had almost killed all the seven Find. So, why is it that in the steel of the ancient king, there was an eight Fin demon? We humans really failed to understand the extent of these demons' powers. Am um, continued to says that it was his fault, that he had failed to live up to the name of the strongest. The eight Fin demon looked at him with golden eyes. Am um wondered what it was trying to do. It flew and landed right in front of him. Reaching towards him. Am um thought it was going to torment his corpse because of what he did. Darkness overwhelms him and soon he woke up in an unfamiliar place. Where am I? Didn't I just die? It doesn't feel like a dream. This feels so realistic. What's happening? Isn't this my face? Where's my handsomely plugged face and gorgeous physique? Who am I? Where am I? He was in Helios City, if you understand what taking part in the warrior exam signifies, it's protection. Helios City's third squadron leader, Jean No Tang, in the year 3069, after the enormous steals of the ancient king brought the apocalypse to our world, thousands of demons flooded out from them and slaughtered us humans. After experiencing the brutal battle in which humans were nearly driven to extinction, humanity finally managed to come up with a way to fight against these demons, grafting equipment. By recycling the internal cores of these demons, humanity was able to utilize the grafting equipment to temporarily obtain strength on par with those demons. Sixty years ago, our greatest and strongest human soldier, An, the man who all warriors hailed as their leader, took charge of all warriors around the world. They battled in what would eventually be known as the strongest demonic wave in history. The battle raged on for many weeks, and humanity was plunged into darkness. Finally, humanity's warriors managed to push back the demonic wave, causing the demons to suffer a tremendous loss in exchange for sixty years of peace and progress for mankind. I've reincarnated sixty years later? I exclaimed. But at the same time, we've lost countless heroic warriors. Even the strongest warrior, An, was said to have died in battle against several highest-ranked seven Finn demons. Therefore, this battle between humanity and demons represents mankind's tenacity and determination to bring forth the dawn of a new era. This was recorded in history as the battle for dawn. An recalled his memory no, that's not right, the seven Finn demon was not just the highest ranked demon but an even higher Finn one. I didn't get a clear look, but I saw it. Humanity has not understood the extent of the demon's capabilities. Jean No Tang continues his speech without them, we would not have survived until now. We would have neither our homeland nor our current lives if not for them. Warriors, pillars of society who embody protection, do you understand what becoming one means now? Everyone shouted yes sir. An mumbled to himself saying this isn't right catching the attention of the commander. He looks at him while he was mumbling and went to him. Telling An he doesn't seem to understand what a warrior entails, asking what his name was. An hesitates to answer him. Thinking, would anyone believe that we are reincarnated sixty years later into this weak and skinny body? The command spoke. I never would have thought. This is an insult to that great name. You have the same name as the greatest warrior, Ang? Huh? You're just a stupid bastard who doesn't have a single ounce of a warrior's spirit. And yet, you dare to desecrate that great name. How dare you yells as he punches Ang straight in the face. Ang thought to himself as he flew from the punch. Is this body really so trash that it can't even react to such a simple attack? But I can't believe this body has the same name as me. Ang lands onto someone. The commander begins to walk away saying. I'll be keeping an eye on you in the upcoming warrior examination. Attention! Everyone replied yes, sir. Make your way to the examination grounds. I'm still alive, at least. Ang says to himself. The man holding Ang says your name's Ang, right? It's a nice name. I'm Lon Snow. Nice to meet you. TCH. He's called on? You aren't any better. Did you think sharing a name would make you as strong as on? said by C. Tullio, an evaluation soldier. 
how childish she says as she leaves them. She's pretty stuck up, isn't she? My name is none of her business. Ang replied angrily. Snow mentions do you not know who she is? She's the most promising warrior in our batch. Situ Liu is known as the cold-blooded demon and is also the eldest daughter of the most renowned martial arts family in Helios City, the Situ family. Situ, how does that name sound familiar? Am thinks to himself as he pulls himself up. A bright flash covers them thanks. Whoa! What a dazzling display of brotherhood. Ah, don't mind me. Please continue. Ang asks who she was as he get a nosebleed. Snow asked if she just took the photo. Ang said that's not the point right now and she says she did take the photo. She introduces herself as Suijo Yuhui saying that the radianting bromance they had totally entranced her, making for good material. The guys think of her as a dimwit. At the fitness test venue. Ang is excited saying my body may be in this state, but I'm ultimately still the strongest warrior. This test is easy, so just you wait. I'll definitely stun everyone by obtaining monstrous grades. First round of tests. Stage 1 of the fitness test, long distance endurance test. Begin. Ang dashes forward thinking to attain first place from just a single spur of energy has to be record breaking. Ang managed to break a record, the record of being in last place and having the worst record in the history of the long distance assessment. Everyone laughed at Ang as he drops onto the ground. Fitness test stage 2, explosive arm strength test. F duck, I sprained my wrist. Oh, I sprained my wrist. On, last place. Was announced. Fitness test stage 3, explosive leg strength test. Ang had only managed to jump 1 meter, making it 3 out of 3, last place. Idiot, said Situ. Ang. Your results for the fitness test put you in last place. You've obtained the worst results we've ever seen. You'll be eliminated. Um. Brother on. Snow consoles on while Suajio says, Is this the last time I'll be able to snap pictures of the place? That guy's results are simply awful. We can eliminate him right now, said a judge. There isn't much hope for that lanky monkey, but he does have the right to participate in the second round of tests. This will probably be his final assessment, too. Let's begin with the second round, the commander replied. Next up, the second round of tests. You will be assessed on your synchronization with grafting equipment. Warrior examinees, please make your way to the testing venue. Ang smiled at the news believing he has a chance. Sixty years ago, the strongest with stable average synchronization rate of 96% and above said Ang this body isn't fit at all, but the synchronization rate is determined by one's willpower. Bunch of bastards mocked me. Just you wait and see. I'll show you the levels of synchronization rate that the strongest warrior can achieve. He said filled with motivation. So this is what the grafting equipment looks like 60 years later. It's gotten a little lighter on thought to himself. 39% synchronization rate. As expected of the strongest rookie of this year, Situ is in a martial arts family, after all. I heard she's been undergoing harsh training since she was young. Nah, that's talent. Do you think you can get the top score on every test with hard work alone? Did you see her earlier? She's really pretty with a ponytail. I like it when her hair's loose, too. She's from a great family, she's strong, and she's beautiful. We really are background characters, huh? She's truly an unattainable flower. The crowd continues to talk. Not bad, Situ Liu. You got whopping 39%. Everyone at earlier, I'm sure it caused a sensation. I don't mind having more admirers, but it's still better to be low-key. Calm down, calm down. Sitilu, you gotta keep your cool. She said to herself. As impressive as it is, this is only the assessment, but she already managed to get a synchronization rate of 39%. She's really strong, isn't she? Snow says. She's full of energy. I can feel the raging, imposing force hidden beneath her slender body. 
Snow continues to say. I can feel it too, said Am. You don't seem nervous at all, though, Snow asked Am. Oh, I'm good. I'm used to it, Am replied. Used to it? Snow is surprised. As the assessment progressed, many rookies who endured the grafting equipment showed pained expressions, remarked someone. When one first undergoes grafting, a burden will be placed on the body due to the impact of the demonic core. Unable to withstand the pain, some would forfeit, explained another. I give up. I give up, I forfeit, yelled Suajio. The synchronization rate needs to reach at least 10% for one to pass, said another person. Sync your nation rate 24%, announced someone making snow pass the test. Of course, there were some unexpected scores too, added another. Suajio, warrior examinee. The synchronization rate is 30%. You have passed. We have found some seedlings with great potential this time. The commander says. Yes, including Suijio Yuhui, this assessment has already seen six examinees with a synchronization rate of and above. Compared to other Sirank cities, our current batch of rookie warriors is of pretty good quality. The lady reports. However, there are some inferior ones here too. As Ung walks up the stage, the crowd starts to talk, saying, Hey, it's that Ung guy's turn. Given his physique, I bet he'll vomit blood on the spot because of the burden on his body. Gah! Mama, in the first round of assessments, that idiot got last place in every single test. Laugh away, you inexperienced brats. Remember to pick up the used wipes from the floor later, Ung thinks to himself. I'll take the red strength core. Ang tells the instructor. Demonic cores collected from the battlefield can be categorized into different types. The most common ones are red, yellow, green, and blue. Red represents strength, yellow represents defense, green represents healing, and blue represents agility. However, there are two rare types of cores. The purple core represents imaginary power, and the black core represents time and space. The black core is especially hard to find. As for synchronization, the most important thing is willpower. The strength of one's willpower determines how much burden one can take from the demonic core. Moreover, it also determines one's mastery over the core. Grafting has succeeded. Are you ready? The instructor asks On. Yes, bring it on, On replies. A bright red light soon shines throughout the testing zone. What a strong reaction. Take a look. Take a look at the synchronization rate of the strongest soldier. Ang screamed in his mind. It has been increasing rapidly. It has already reached 40% in just a moment. 40%? Has anyone ever gotten a synchronization rate of 96% before? Raise it even higher. The instructors are yelling, in disbelief of what they are seeing. Ang forces himself to rise even further. What's going on? How could we be having such an absurd synchronization? Was there a mistake somewhere? The commander is shocked. It's still climbing. 65%. 70%, the lady reports. What's going on? 60% now? Is it me? Is the equipment malfunctioning? The crowd shouted shocked by the results. I was once the strongest warrior, hailed as king by others, and if not for my low level of this synchronization, if not for my weak body, my imposing demeanor would have driven all of you to your knees. Ang stands up like a god and says, That's the difference between you and me, brats. But a sudden feeling like sinking into the ocean overcomes him. What happened? My strength disappeared. I can't move anymore, Ang tells the instructor. What the hell? It really malfunctioned. The synchronization rate instantly dropped to 10%. Yelling at Ang. Captain, we just detected that the demonic core has cracked. That abnormal core likely caused the data glitch. That was terrifying. The equipment was malfunctioning, the commander was relieved to hear that. What happened? 
my synchronization rate stopped at 10%, correct? He asked her. Yes. He barely passed, she replied. Brother On, Snow yells rushing over to On. Exactly. That only happened because of the abnormal, demonic core. And here I was, thinking he's amazing. Bah, the crowd says. Brother On, are you alright? Snow asks as On faints. You have a point. Look at that scrawny body of his. How could he have gotten that absurd synchronization rate? That synchronization rate is comparable to that of a captain from an S-rank city. Ha ha ha, the crowd continues to make fun of On. False. I wouldn't have been so easily beaten by someone less dazzling than me in this town. Never allow it. It's all my fault. Why did I try to compete with those brats? I'm glad I managed to pass. Ang says as he rests in Snow's arm. In the resting area, Ang wonders to himself, what was that just now? It felt like it came from the depths of my heart. It sucked out all my power in an instant. I've never heard of such a situation before. I clearly had enough willpower to maintain a synchronization rate of at least 80%. Even if it was a demonic core of the lowest level, it shouldn't have cracked like that. So, why did it happen? The doors open, and a man yells. Attention! Everyone in the room responded yes, sir. Yes, sir. The commander enters the room and says. Congratulations on making it into the final round of assessments. The practical test. You will now face a demon for the first time in your lives. I hope everyone here can pass this test safely and smoothly. Line up and head to the venue of assessment, now. Go! Ang tries his best to walk out the room as the commander stands beside him, looking at him and thinks as he clenches the red gem. I'm really curious about you, Ang. I wonder what you'll show me in the next assessment, hunting in the fog beyond the walls. Out in the open, the students are gathered in front of a massive wall. Someone shouts to open the compound door. Whoa! My God, this is the first time I've left the city after 60 years. Everyone lives in such isolated cities. Do you think the areas outside the gates are always covered in fog? The students discuss among themselves. The instructors yells at them be quiet and leave the city. You should spend your time checking your equipment instead, or you could end up dead without even knowing it. Am checks his equipment and thinks to himself. They gave me another intact strength cope, but I don't think the problem lies in the cope. Back then, my power dissipated once. Something in my body rejected it. Just what is going on? Is it a side effect of transmigration? As he walks out the door, a sudden feeling overwhelms him. The moment he stepped foot outside, a signal was sent all over the area, the demon beasts all sense it. Deep within a cave, the signal reaches a powerful demon. The demon sensing it stood up from its seat of bones and bodies, and couldn't believe that there was another demon that outranked it. What is that? Were all those things I saw, demons? At that moment, I felt as though something was resonating deep within my heart. Ang is terrified at what he felt just now. Are you moving or not? Situ asks Ang as she stood behind him. Ang says sorry. Brother Ang, what's wrong? Snow asked as he approached both of them. The instructor in front yells the four of at the back. Group up. The rest of the students are prepared so hurry up and get over here. The four of them rush to join the others. Oh. Was forming a team your strategy? Sujio asks on. No. I was just. Just don't drag the team down, Sitchu tells on, but in fact she was feeling scared that nobody would want to team up with her. Let's go, brother on. We've got to do our best. Snow pats on back. The team is formed. Suijio says as she takes a selfie. Dispelling steel, a black steel made of a solid stone mixture. The stone contained within is a special substance that can dispel the fog. The instructor announces to the students. You will undergo a teamwork assessment in teams of four. Make sure you all know what the test entails. It's venturing into the fog beyond the walls. 
Each team will now receive combat daggers as well as a mini fog dispelling device, made of the same material as the dispelling steel. Your mission is very straightforward. Enter the fog and make your way to the designated area. They have been marked with lights. Insert the device into the fog, hunt for demons. Your individual strength and cooperation will both determine whether you pass or fail this trial. Cooperation and individual strength are both crucial. All of you are now tasked with hunting in the fog beyond the walls. It is the terrifying trial rookies must face at the end. In this world covered in fog, the only way to survive is to have a strong team and the courage to face your fears. In the world covered in mist, the warriors are expected to face the unknown dangers that lurk in the mist. Good physique and skillfulness are not the only qualities needed to become a warrior. One also requires a strong mentality, fearlessness towards the fog, the ability to cooperate and rely on their team while facing the unknown, and the ability to overcome one's fears. To earn the title of warrior, the participants need to get a good look at the area, fight the demons that appear at random, and make their first kill. The speaker announces the assessment is over for one team, and the next team needs to get ready. A woman with orange hair is seen standing high above on the walls, she says out loud. There are lots of outstanding rookies in this batch. My target is clear, though. The only one I'm interested in is Sitalu from the Sidu family. This was the Helios City 2nd Squadron leader Dada Gel. She turns and asks two others. How about you guys? A seedling from a martial arts family. If she's guided well, she might become a great warrior replied by 1st Square and leader Joel. There is another person worth watching out for, On the commander said as he looks down at the students, he thinks to himself. I have sent it for checking, but there seems to be nothing wrong with the core. So what exactly happened back there? As Jell taps his head and says what are you thinking about, Tang Tang? Don't call me that. Jean shouts while blushing. Joel says that Jell is the only one who can make you blush since the start, Tang Tan. The same goes for you. Jean says to Joel. On a side note, have the demon's grades been confirmed? We must ensure that the test venue only contains the finless demons we prepared beforehand. Jell asks the both of them. Yeah, don't worry. To ensure the participants' safety, we've checked over and over in the past few days that no one fin demons are to be found within Helios City's vicinity. Jean replies. If one really appeared, we've got to do everything we can to protect this batch of future warriors said by Joel as the three of them watch over the students. The instructor calls out to the next group saying that the current group had finished and that the venue has been set up. The crowd talks as the next group was with Sitalu and Ang. The four prepare themselves as Ang says that it's their turn now. Situ grabs the capsule from Ang, confusing him. She dashes forward quickly, turning back to tell them to follow her dazzling self. Ang is annoyed wondering why she liked to have so much attention and yells out to follow her. The three of them quickly chase after her. Situ jumps up high, flipping through the air before landing the capsule into the device. Jell says she has a recovery core, but her physique is no worse than those with the blue cores. Is this what the foundation of someone in a martial arts family looks like? Three red demons roar as they dash towards Situ. An yells to Snow Breakthrough, Snow replies got it. He preps himself before making a gigantic leap towards the demons, landing between them and Situ. The demons jump towards Snow as a yellow energy covers his fists. A yellow shield blocks the attack of the demons. Jean sees this and is impressed that Snow had gotten used to the core power. Ang arrives, telling Situ and Tomo to kill the demons one by one. They agreed. Covered in the aura of their stone, green, red, and blue. The three of them rush to the demons. Round 1, Tomo versus the demon. She easily slices it up and dropkicks the demon straight to hell. Before the demon could even land on the ground, Snow uses the one-inch punch to send it flying. Joel praises their teamwork from above. Noting that the girl in blue has enhanced the rhythm in her movements in a perverted way. Jean calls him out. Round 2, Sidhu versus the demon. She leaps and stabs the demon on its belly. 
causing it to explode in a green explosion as she walks away. Round 3, On versus the Demon He needs the demon in the balls, thinking to strike its three vital areas first. The neck, chest, and abdomen. As he rolls alongside the demon, knowing that his current body can only bring out a limited amount of power in one go, he thinks to use this battle to test his limits. He speeds over to the demon in an instant. The monster readies its fist to punch on as he dashes to it. Ong dodges the punch with ease. He returns a punch back to the monster causing it to roar. He thinks that he didn't respond quick enough. The monster tries to kick on but he dodges by bending backwards. He switches the knife to his left hand. Turns over from the bent position and stabs the monster in the stomach while thinking that his body coordination is poor as well. The monster shakes in pain, and tries to claw it on. But he takes the knife out, leaping to the side, and slices the monster right in its mouth. The monster falls to the ground as on lands behind it thinking he still doesn't have enough explosive power. The others look at him from the back. Snow says that he thinks Ang was just playing with his opponent while Tomo hoped she captured Ang's fight on camera and said he thinks Ang just wanted to take the spotlight and was doing it on purpose. Up on the walls, Jell asks who the scrawny boy was and said that he was impressive Joe adds on that Ang moves like a veteran as all three leaders looked at Ang. Jean remains silent. Back at the battle. Ang is sweating hard. He wipes his sweat concluding that with this new body he would not be able to use any of his old skills and that after moving a while he had already ran out of breath making it worst. He takes a step forward as he finishes assessing himself. The monster was bleeding all over as Ong rushes towards it telling it that it's time for it to die. But before he could reach it something came out from the ground. The red spike appeared right before his eyes. It pierces the monster straight in its stomach as Ang was blown away from the impact. The team looks at it wondering what it was as the tree roots surrounds them. A clawed hand emerges. Within the monster's body was two claws. It rips it apart showing another monster inside. Ang is shocked to see this. The new monster slowly comes out. It lets out a bloody scream. That could be heard all the way to the city. The leaders sense it. Jean felt it and showed signs of fear. He shouts out loud one fin demon. He orders all cadets to retreat to the city. The cadets all run for their lives in fear. Jell and Joel jumps down quickly. Landing on the grounds below. Dust covers the area from the impact of the jump. Both of them quickly run towards the cadets who were retreating. Jell tells them not to panic and to stay beside leader Jean as he will escort them back to the city. Human? But I smell a demon? Said an eerie voice. Ang looks at it terrified wondering what it was saying. The monster walks slowly and asks which one. It gave off a hellish aura as it walks to the team. Snow, Tomo and Sidu all shake with fear as Sidu compares the no-fin demons earlier that it was nothing compared to the one-fin demon. She visualizes that from its aura alone it could rip her into pieces in a blink of any eye. She couldn't even move her body. The monster stands tall in front of Ang as he thinks that his current body is no match for a one-fin demon. For the first time, Ang was experiencing what normal warriors felt when facing a fin demon. The monster counts as it put its clawed hand up. A bright red light emerges from each of its fingers as it wants to bring all of them back with it. A fast laser hits all four of them in the head. They lose consciousness. And all fell to the ground. The monster looks back as the tree root behind it cracked. Leader Jell and Joel breaks through the tree roots. Joel shouts at the monster telling it not to touch the cadets. It laughs at his face. As the leaders rush to the cadets, the tree roots surround themselves around the monster and the cadets. The monster smiles as the roots covers it. It said by as the monster and cadets disappear into the ground. The leaders are shocked that a monster had taken four cadets. The ground near the hole swells up. And starts to move alerting the leaders. Joel says to go after it. Deep in the forest. Leader Jell and Joel inspects the ground tunnel seeing that it finally stopped. 
Jell tells Joel that Jean had checked the place seven days in a row to make sure that a one fin demon would not appear so how did one come? Looking at the tunnel Jell curses saying this has never happened before. A figure from above calls their names as they look up. Jean had arrived and was asking where the cadets were. He shouts at them asking why they stopped searching and that they should continue chasing after them. Joel asks Jean to calm down and tells him that the track stopped here. Jell added on by saying that the demon dug underground once it reached this point as Jean inspects the tunnel. Jean touches the track. A memory of his younger brother comes into his mind. Bastard. He yells as he smashes the ground. He talks to himself saying it's his fault and that he should have checked properly. It's all my fault. He screams. Joel tells them that they should head back as the people in the city will be panicking and that the three of them can't be away from the city. Jell stay silent. She then comforts Jean saying none of them wanted this to happen and that he needs to calm down. Jean pushes her hand away from him gently. He slowly stands up and tells them both to go back and that he'll search for the cadets a little longer. Joel asks Jean to stop. But Jell interrupts him telling Jean to make sure he comes back before sunset. Jean with a sad face turns to her and says yeah I know. He runs into the fog. Jell tells Joel that they wouldn't be able to convince Jean to stop and Jean scratches his head agreeing with her saying that Jin's little brother was taken by a demon in the past and that he had been blaming himself for that ever since. She then says that if Jin's younger brother was still alive he would be the same age as the cadets. Looking at the sky, she says that Jean thinks of the cadets as his younger brother. In a dark cave someone wakes up. It was on he wonders where they were. He looks around and sees everyone tied up but at least they were alive he says. A voice from the darkness whispers to Ang you woke up? Ang quickly turns his head. And sees the one fin demon behind him. Ang struggles to free himself while the demon walks past him saying that Ang woke up so quickly making him different. Ang notices a piece of bone on the ground while the demon walks in front of him saying it was very curious. But something blocks his mouth. The demon slams Ang hard into the pillar he was tied to making it crack. It holds Ang's face close and asks him why he smelled like a stronger demon than it. Ang replies what the fuck are you talking about as it squeezes his face. Ang releases his red aura making him free from the restraints and causes the demon to fall back. He quickly lands on his feet and grabs the sharp bone. He slices at the demon by it dodges it easily. The demon readies its claws saying how lively. It swings its claws at Ang but Ang dodges it with a backflip. He quickly backs away from the demon. Thinking to himself that if it was the him from the before he could have taken the demon's head before it could even react. He also has to save the other three. Once again Ang rushes towards the demon. He analyzes the demon as a red cord making it agile with flexible joints that allow for quick reactions and attacks. That's useless the demon said as it reaches out with its claws. Ang tilts his head hoping to dodge. But the demon's claw pierces through him. Ang holds onto the demon tightly with its claws in his body as this was the only chance he had. He spots the weakness. And stabs the demon in its joints. He holds the arm tightly and rips it out. The demon yells. As An looks at it and says that it shouldn't have looked down on him as he had killed a ton of one fin demons before. But the demon smiles. It knees On in the stomach with extreme force. Causing he cough up blood as his eyes turn white. The demon flings On across the area with dust all around the place. Deep in the dust there is a hole in the wall. Ang's blood was splattered from the impact on the wall as his body just sits there not moving. The demon tells him he may know its weakness but it was a wood type with a red core as its arm regenerates. I can mend myself the demon says as its arm completely heals. Ang opens one of his eyes and sees that it can heal itself. He was shocked to know that the demons have evolved after half a century. You're the one that looked down on me the demon says. It bends at clawed finger. Spikes rips into Ang from the wall behind him. The demon calls it to come as Ang's body is sent flying towards it with the tree roots. The demon grabs Ang's head. Ang glares at the demon as it holds his head. 
the demon lets go of Aang's head saying it doesn't understand him and to forget it. Aang looks at the ground in a blurry state believing that the spikes had punctured his internal organs and that it was so painful to the point he couldn't breathe and that he was gonna die even though he just reincarnated. He looks at his teammates thinking they would die too. He recalls his past memories of his teammates dying in front of him. Aang says I'm sorry everyone as his eyes slowly close. He laughs as his blood drips on the ground saying he couldn't accept this. The demon looks at Ang and sees that he was dead calling him a weak human. It wonders if it will evolve if it eats Ang. The demon opens its mouth wide and decides to eat Ang. But a figure appears. Releasing a strong aura from Ang's body asking the demon if it would eat him. The demon senses the powerful energy and immediately backs away from Ang. A voice from Aang's body says you can't die here like this or else all my plans will go to waste. The red core cracks. The mysterious voice continues to say I can't believe that the last silver of my consciousness would be used here like this. The demon shrieks at the terrifying presence. The demon realizes the power was increasing from five fin to six fin and more as Aang's body is covered in a deadly red aura. Aang's body completely heals. As the red aura enters his body, slowly changing him, one by one, soon on completely changed, he opens his eyes, and a huge red pillar emerges from him. It pierces the ground straight into the sky. Demons around the area were shocked by it. The aura reaches the demons, and erases them from existence. The red pillar of aura slowly disappears. As the red energy converges deep underground, a red demon is floating in the air and says, I am the only eight fin demon that exists. The crimson crystal's strongest existences. Your king. The one fin demon stutters, calling the red demon an eight fin and its king. Kneel, the red demon says. And it kneels before it. Speak my name. Crimson fin king, the demon replied. The Crimson Fin King was on. Misty ruins. Jean is seen speeding through it. Until something catches his eyes. He sees two demons and dashes to them. Appearing behind one of them in an instant. He whacks and strike them hard. Raising his leg high, striking down hard on the demon. Jean had finished patrolling the area, but only saw two two fin demons in the area. He looks up, sad that the children were not here. Staring at the sky, he believes they should find them before nightfall. But an intense red pillar of power appeared behind him. Waves of power were seen moving through the air. He covers his face, wondering what the hell it was. Seeing the source of the pillar, he realizes that the children were over there. Back in the cave, Ang in demon form descends in front of the weak demon. Fins began to grow back on his feet. He stands in front of the demon as it calls on its king. The eight fin demon could not believe that the sky was as dark as before when it makes its return. It tells the demon to answer its question from when he vanished. The eight fin wonders if the five demon lords were still alive. The demon bows down, telling the eight fin that the five demon lords are still alive, and their positions have not changed. The eight fin remarked that they were still living peacefully with one another but begins to laugh out loud, unleashing a powerful aura. The eight fin strikes the air, saying that the five demon lords had forgotten what they did to him. The eight fin explained that he chose Ang to be his container as he was the strongest, but never thought the body would be so weak now. And that this was its last consciousness and was wasted in this situation, and if it wanted to appear again, it will only be at the time of its awakening. It trembles as it touches its throat, thinking that Ang was testing its patience, and that it needed Ang to slowly awaken and understand the Finn memories. The demon asks the king if the Finn memories were the same ones they used. And the king explains to it that its race was unique and with Finn memories, they stood above all demons. And that Ang unlike other demons, just needs to devour demons of higher levels to promote. The king tells the demon that this was the gift that gave to Ang. The demon raises up, shouting that it would do everything to support the king, willing to give up its right and left arm. But the king slices it into pieces, saying it was not worth to do so. 
and that its only worth was to awaken Aang's first Finn memory. The king tells Ans it has prepared the first step, and to not disappoint the king in the future, as it needs Ans to awaken to the eighth Finn. As the king slowly disappears from Aang's body, Ans falls as the king tells it that when the time comes, as Aang's core absorbs the demon memories, that the king will awaken once more from its slumber. The core and the demon blood mix together, allowing for An and the king to become one. An recalls a memory of a soldier dying in front of him, calling him the strongest king. The soldier tells An he doesn't want to die, An tells him he won't as he reaches out to him. The soldier grabs Aang's hand hard, as his face turns into an undead telling On why he was the only one still alive. On wakes up from the nightmare, thinking it was only just a dream. Voices called out to On. It was his teammates, they were happy to see him awake. Sway Ji lends close to his face, asking why his hair color changed and if it was because of the demonic door. On couldn't believe she came this close, and asks her what she meant. He looks around, asking if all of them were okay since the cave. Jean appears, telling Ang that it seems that he remembers something. Appearing with all the leaders, he asked Ang to tell them what happened. Ang was surprised to see all three captains in the room. Jell tells him that Jean was the one that brought the four of them back. Jean whispers to her not to call him Tang Tang in front of him. But they all heard the nickname Tang Tang. Joel tells them they found them outside the cave. That they were unconscious, and that no demon was found making it easy for them to bring them back safely. Jell tells Ang that he was the only one that experienced changes, showing him a mirror. Ang stares at this reflection, wondering why his hair change. He thinks about what he should tell them about the cave and his reincarnation, but decides not to say. He tells them that he just woke up vaguely, and now wakes up in the hospital. Jean remains silent. Thinking back to the blood he found in the cave, wondering what caused it. Joel sits beside Ang, telling him he saw his results, and that his foundation was weak, but when fighting demons, he seemed very calm. He looks at Ang, asking if he had fought demons before. Ang tells him he didn't and only studies hard about fighting demons. Jell is impressed by him for being a bookworm, saying that many people should be like that. But Ang remembers about his test results, asking them what they were. Sui Ji appears again telling him that he passed and they were still a team. His team tells him that Jean had made them a team making it fate. Sidhu tells Ang that they have fallen behind the other teams, surprising Ang. Jean tells Ang that he was asleep for three days, and that his team had zero points now. Ang screams out that he couldn't believe that he was in a coma for three days. The team wears their armor and prepares. The crowd in the city all look. Curious about the Aang's new team with Captain Jean. Jean begins to inform the team of the rules. And that they have ophically become warriors. And congratulates them for returning from the One Fin Demon safely. He then informs them that the four of them are a team, under his command, and he was in charge of nine teams and wants them to stand out. Ang raises his hand, asking how they could stand out. Sidhu turns away from him as they were currently ranked last. Jean explains to them that they had a point system, to stimulate healthy competition through point rankings to improve teams. They can obtain points by completing mission, and the captain and team with the lowest points will be punished. As seen in the back of Jean, the punishment will be being demoted to the cleaning crew. Ang looks around realizing why the city was so clean. Jean announces that Situ will be the team leader as she has the highest points. No one objects to the choice except Ang, thinking why they didn't choose the strongest warrior. Taking a step forward, Sidhu shouts loudly that they will complete their mission. The day soon reaches the afternoon. Jean turns to leave, telling them to look at other teams' points and decide on a mission. He advises to find him if they face any problems. Jean demisses the team at once. Sidhu tells the team to look at the mission board as their team was far behind the others. But Sui Ji tells her to stop, and that something else was more important. Sidhu turns around embarrassed, wondering what it was that she missed. Sui Ji tells her that they needed to take a photo as a team first. 
Sidhu stares at her in disbelief. Ang whispers that small teams as a whole. Was not a bad idea as he smiles widely. A photo is taken of their team, aka, death flag for the three of them. Jean is seen with the other captains, asking what they think. Jean tells them that there were signs of demons' blood splattered all over, Joel looks him, wondering if he though the kids did it. Jean tells him he suspects Ahn. Because he could smell a familiar but unquoned stink from him. Jell hugs him from the back, saying he was overthinking, and that the kids are back safe and everything's fine. She tells him that the team seems strong and that he should take care of them, so he won't lose to hers, but Jean tells her he was serious. Joel just smokes his cigarette. Telling him that they will keep an eye on Ahn. Back at the city mission board, Ahn is staring at it. He was happy that there were three A-rank missions, and they could earn ten points with each. But Swayji and Snow tells him that a rank mission were difficult as Sidhu remains silent. He explains to Ang that, even though a ranks give more points, they result in more casualties than C and C rank missions. Ang tells him he understands. And tells him that if that's the case. As all the mission are taken of the board. He and Sidhu tells the team, that they should take it all. The team is now seen running through the jungle. Ahn presses onto his red core on his chest, causing it to activate and spread out a gold machinery. He looks back, seeing wings on his back, amazed that this was Nano Wing. It allows him to quickly dash past the others towards a huge boulder and slams against it once he arrives. Ahn looks at his hand, imaging the Nano Wing disintegrating and changing into a weapon. A dagger soon formed in his hands from the Nano Wing. He holds it tightly in his handly amazed that this was nano-equipment, and that technology had truly evolved in the past sixty years. The rest of the group arrives at the boulder, Situ asks them if they were ready, and they all responded with a yes. She informs them of the two no-fin demons as their targets, and that they needed to kill them in one go. She shouts at them to follow the plan and to head out. They dashed out of the cover of the boulder, with Snow leading the charge. The demons are alarmed by their arrival, they roar fiercely as the team approaches them. Siddha thinks to end this quickle as they head over to the demons, as they can't afford to waste time, because they have three more A-rank missions to complete. Snow arrives first to the demons, slamming his foot deep within the ground, he kicks up, creating a giant wave made of stone, blocking the demons' attacks. But the demons are confused, as Snow and the team had disappeared from in front of them. This was according to Situ's plan as Ang and Tomo were the onces to incapacitate them. Ang and Tomo appears from both sides of the demons. They slices the legs of the demons in order to stop them from moving. Ang turns to see the demons, thinking he can't wait to see them flail after he breaks their joints. Both the demons kneel onto the ground due to Ang's and Tomo's attack. Snow appears before the two demons, preparing his mighty fist up their ass and slamming both their jaws shut with an uppercut. With the demons now in the air, Situ appears, thinking to end this fight in a magnificent manner. Her neon strikes lit up the place, as she manages to land all her attacks. The demons both start to glow up from her attack, because of the overload treatment skill. They blow up, as Situ thinks of her performance as splendid. Tomo places down the device, clearing the fog at last. Snow wipes the sweat off his face, happy that the fight was over, as their mission was to dispel the fog, which was harder than the exams, and took way too long to complete. The demons dropped a red core. Tomo giggles happily seeing the red core in her hands as the team gathers. Sita thanks the team for their hard work and that they've earned ten points, as Ang is surprised to see the completed missions automatically destroyed. So high tech he says. Tomo explains to him that there's a chip in the mission, linked to the point leaderboard in the city. Once the mission is completed, the leaderboard updates the points instantly. She tells him that they had completed the dispelling the fog outside the city mission, and asks if she could take a look. She sees that they still had two missions left that were both pretty difficult. She drops to the ground, thinking how hard the missions were gonna be, and that they still had a look way to go. Snow laughs telling her it won't be easy but they had their team working hard. Sita calls for their attention, wanting to go through their plan. 
and it was that they were gonna finish the two remaining rank missions, and more rank missions, to aim straight for the top. Tomo sees her as sparking, deciding to take photos of her, as Snow is fired up, wanting the team to hurry up straight to the top. Snow calls out to Brother Ong, asking what he thought of the plan, but Ong tells him to just call him Ong, no brother as they were comrades. Ong stretches and tells them that the plan was right, other teams were working hard, and they needed to be more active. Ong thinks to himself, that he never expected to feel this way, after living across two lifetimes. He thinks of his team, as they had made him feel his youthful passion again, making one energetic. Ang tells them they need to complete their mission before sunset, and they should go now. Tomo is excited to go for the mission, as Sidhu thinks that Ang stole all her cool lines. The sun slowly starts to set. As Snow calls out to the team, that he was done tying up the demon. He shouts out loud, happy that the team captured three demons alive. Sidhu checks the tranquilizer, seeing that they had run out of tranquilizers to capture no fin demons, as at each team were given a few special bullets. An looks curiously at the weapon Sidhu was holding. Sidhu couldn't believe that An needed another explanation, so she tells him that it was called Demon Tranquilizer Gun created from nanoparticles, but was harder to create and using it was far too complex. An then inspects the demons they captured, curious to see that demons could be captured using tranquilizers. He recalls in the past, where they had to knock out the demons using force which made researchers upset as the demons would have brain damage. Snow informs them that they had completed the mission, before they ran out of tranquilizer bullets. And that in order to capture three, they needed to kill an entire group. Tomo stretches her fine body saying they needed to go back to the city before sunset, as it was an ironclad rule, if they were late they would be punished, but on a side note damn I may be AI, but that booty though, okay let's take a moment to appreciate the artwork here lads. One, two, three, and now back to the story. She turns to them, saying they should go home to eat dinner, making Ang think about whether he had a place to call home now. Sidhu agrees with Tomo, saying she needed to go back to the dojo, they just needed the coordinates for the researches to collect the demons, making the mission complete. But as she asks them if they felt a murderous aura, a red shriek of light passes by them. A bullet is seen curving through the air destroying all the demons' heads in one gun, like that movie wanted. Situ and Ang were shocked to see this happen in front of their eyes. A voice speaks out to them, saying they can't let them complete this mission, as a barrel of a gun is revealed. The team shouts, who's there, hoping to find the person responsible. Another team appears in the tree and on top of a boulder, that team asks if Ang's team were the ones who took all the A-rank missions. The red hair with a mask, then tells them, they were the ones planning to take those missions, who let you have them, he asks, Ang asked who they were. The mysterious red mask told him that they were Black Gun, a squad that joined squadron leader Ji Yaotang in the last assessment. In simpler terms, they were Ang's seniors in one of the nine squads, as explained by the red masked person. The red mask asked the team member how many new squads had joined Ji Yaotang this time. She replied that there were three. Looking at Aang's squad, the Red Mask told them they were a rookie squad who had not shown respect to their seniors yet, being rebellious. Suddenly, they all leaped forward and appeared right in front of Aang's squad, expressing their disapproval of the fact that Aang's team had taken all the A-rank missions for themselves without seeking approval from the seniors and not taking them seriously. Meanwhile, Lu was staring at the dead monster corpse. It was the same monster her team had spent a significant amount of time and effort capturing. She looked at it intensely, clenching her teeth tightly as she thought about the tremendous amount of hard work they had put into capturing these demons. She asked the Red Mask who their leader was. Just as he asked why she hadn't asked her team to greet them yet, Lu dashed towards him in an instant. She spun in the air, attempting to land a kick on the Red Mask. However, he easily dodged her kick by bending backward, as if he were in the Matrix. Confused by her actions, the Red Mask yelled at her for daring to attack her seniors, labeling them as undisciplined rookies. Anger consumed Lu as she readied her fist to attack, telling the Red Mask how dare he call themselves their seniors. Before she could attack, her teammates appeared and held her back, urging her not to act rashly. 
they reminded her that they were still their seniors, and it would be better to talk things out. While they restrained Lu, they told the Red Mask that they were being unreasonable and couldn't just kill the demons they had captured with so much effort. However, the Red Mask laughed off their claim of being unreasonable. With a disapproving gaze, he told them that this was a competition and that they were being naive. Lu's anger flared up at the mention of being naive. Internally, she labeled the Red Mask a bastard for ruining their mission. As a leader, she questioned how she could face her squad now. She screamed in her mind. Snow then turned back to call on. As he was about to discuss the situation and suggest talking it out with the seniors, Ong dashed past him in a red blur. He leaped right in front of the Red Mask, kicking him straight in the face while telling him to F off. Red Mask's team shouted out in worry. Ang stood tall and expressed that he had never seen people oppressing rookies and that the rules were bullshit. Ang's team was shocked and surprised by his actions, but Lu gave him a thumbs up. Red Mask was trembling in pain as he held his face, calling them bastards for treating their seniors this way. He called out to his team, Black Gun, to get ready for battle. The three members readied their weapons in agreement with the Red Mask's order, preparing to attack Aang's team. However, before the clash could happen, a voice echoed loudly in the air, shouting, What buffoonery! Jean appeared instantaneously between Ang and the Red Mask, just as they were about to attack each other. Jean grabbed onto Aang's leg while simultaneously blocking the Red Mask's punch. In a single fluid motion, Jean hurled both of them in different directions, sending Ang and the Red Mask flying back to their respective teams. Ang thought to himself that he couldn't see the standards of modern warriors, as they wouldn't even be fighting. Jean appeared wearing a red deadly aura, covering his body. He turned to the two squads and scolded them for not caring about their survival when the sun was about to set. Red Mask complained to Jean that Ang's team had started the fight and even tried to smack the mask off his face. Lu looked at the Red Mask and called him a child for complaining to Jean, which angered the Red Mask. Tomo then brought out her camera and showed Jean the photo proof that Red Mask's team had killed their demons. Snow was surprised to find out that Tomo had taken pictures. Jean asked them if they had taken the A-rank mission of capturing demons. Lu informed him that they had already completed the mission, but the Black Gun Squad destroyed their efforts. Jean closed his eyes, showing understanding. He explained to Aang's team that while they might think Black Gun had gone too far, it was actually a common experience for rookies. He looked at Lu and told her that their response was up to them. Jean further explained that the city only looked at a squad's points and that all forms of competitive actions were allowed. These rules applied to every city. He continued by saying that as warriors, they would face greater challenges in the future and wouldn't be dealing with these basic threats. He concluded his speech by stating that he had intervened in the fight only because the sun was setting, and they should return to the city. He then told the Red Mask that he felt embarrassed for him, having a rookie team steal an A-rank mission from them. The Red Mask could only respond with a simple yes, sir and slowly made his way back to his team. As he walked away, he turned to Ang and asked for his name. Ang looked at him and simply replied, Ang. Shock registered on the Red Mask's face as he heard the name. He began laughing out loud, telling his team about Ang's name, while Ang remained silent, stating that the Red Mask had asked for it. As the Red Mask left, he told Ang that he wouldn't allow his squad to easily earn points from now on. Steam erupted from his body as he vowed to make sure that Ang's team would rank last on the leaderboard this month. He walked towards his fallen mask on the ground, pointed to his injured face, and promised to return the favor. He then grabbed his mask and placed it back onto his face while calling out to his team. They all disappeared in an instant. Jean informed Ang's team that Black Gun might not be the strongest squad, but they would do whatever it took to distract and destroy their mission progress. They were known for their swift execution, led by Red Mask, who excelled in firearms. Although he hadn't used a firearm in the previous fight, Jean was sure that Black Gun would win if both teams clashed. Upon hearing this, Lu fell into silent contemplation. Jean concluded his speech and told them it was time to return to the city. Lu decided to forget about the conflict and urged the team to move on. 
She looked at Ahm, wondering why he was spacing out and if he was just trying to look cool. But before leaving, she told him that his kick was pretty cool, catching Aang's attention. Snow asked if they wanted to have dinner, but they all declined, mentioning they had plans. However, Ang had his own plan of capturing the three demons alive by himself. Night falls upon the city, with a large moon shining overhead. An announcement is made, urging the citizens to remain within the city for their safety. The repeated warnings emphasize the importance of not leaving. Meanwhile, Ang hides himself, reflecting on the fact that he hasn't seen many people since the warning. He assumes they are likely at home due to the lockdown. Curiosity piques his interest, and he contemplates what homes look like after completing the mission. Peering out from his hiding spot, he notices that people are not as vigilant as he expected. Spotting a sign indicating a temporary emergency gate, Ang squats down and ponders whether the city is short-staffed or if they simply believe no one would leave at night. He compares the present situation to his past experiences, noting that in the past, day or night didn't matter during their missions. Ang is confident that finding demons at night will be easy and that he can capture three no-fin demons with his previous life's forceful approach. He smiles at the thought of capturing the three demons before morning, despite the potential interference from Red Mask and his team. Ang considers himself a genius for devising this plan. Suddenly, a voice startles Ang, and he turns to see Lu standing beside him. Lu finds it exciting to sneak around at night since becoming a warrior, as it grants her more freedom. Ang, now standing up, tells Lu that she scared him. She questions his reason for sneaking around at night during the lockdown, although internally, she is delighted by the idea of venturing outside the city at night. Ang whistles nonchalantly, pretending not to understand what she is talking about and claiming he was just taking a stroll. It's worth noting that Ang, despite being the strongest warrior in human history, struggles to lie convincingly. Lu looks at him, aware of his poor acting skills, and Aang's stomach growls loudly, exposing his subpar performance. Frustrated with his acting, Aang gives up and admits to Lu that he wanted to surprise the team by completing the mission that Red Mask's team ruined earlier. Since Lu discovered his intentions, he asks her not to report him to the higher-ups. Planning to return, Ang is taken aback when Lu insists on joining him, surprising him with her determination. Lu smiles and asks about the plan, feeling like a genius herself and getting excited at the thought of Red Mask and his team's reactions. Ang questions why Lu let out an evil chuckle, but Lu denies doing anything mischievous. Meanwhile, atop the high walls, two warriors can be seen. One is yawning, while the other is busy eating. NPC One expresses how torturous standing guard feels, remarking that anyone leaving the city at night must have a death wish. NPC Two tells NPC One to be quiet, calling him an idiot, and warns him not to let the other squadron leaders hear such statements. NPC Two explains that the gap in the gates is for emergencies. In the past, human survivors sought refuge in the city but were tragically killed by demons due to the gates opening a few seconds late. Since then, almost every city decided to leave an emergency gap in their main gate to prevent such tragedies from recurring. NPC-1 apologizes for his lack of knowledge, but NPC-2 reassures him, taking out an item that brings joy to men in the middle of the night, a photo book featuring female warriors from other cities. Blushing happily, NPC-1 holds the newest photo book, and NPC-2 cautions him to be careful with it, given its cost. Both of them giggle as they enjoy the photo book together. Seizing the distraction, Lu and An seize the opportunity to sneak out of the city. As An looks ahead, he recognizes the area as the previous assessment venue, where the fog is denser at night. He calls out to Lu, instructing her to follow him in a particular direction. Eventually, they reach an empty area, and Lu notes that they are far enough from the city to avoid detection. The decaying forest will provide adequate concealment. Ang informs her that it's time to initiate the plan, he will lure the monsters, and she will knock them out with brute force. Ang leaves the area first, instructing Lu to wait for his signal. Lu's hands tremble as she contemplates Ang's confidence in venturing alone into the night fog. Uncertain whether her feelings are fear or excitement, she focuses on the task at hand. With determination, she looks ahead 
prepared to launch her attacks once Ong returns. Ong reappears, being chased by a huge red demon. Liu is shocked by Ang's ability to serve as bait. Ang lands on a tree, deftly evading the monster's attack. He calls out to Liu, who appears right behind him, and they simultaneously kick the monster in the face. They continue this strategy of striking the monster's faces, making it easier for them to capture the creatures together. They employ their elbows to knock out another monster, using coordinated attacks from both sides. However, this method of capture drains their stamina and strength. Wiping the sweat off his face, Ang acknowledges that he still needs to train his weak body, realizing that these no-fin demons used to be mere playthings in his past life. Lu brings a monster to Ang, indicating it's the last one and that they are finished. She finds the mission more exhausting than her dojo's strength training. Ang instructs her to leave the monster there, explaining that no fin demons lack intelligence and do not save their own kind. Furthermore, they would not approach the city. Leaving the three monsters behind poses no problem. Ang taps the monster's head and assures Lu that their combined attacks ensure they won't wake up anytime soon. Tomorrow, they will return to this spot to submit the monsters for the mission. Lu expresses curiosity about Ang's knowledge, prompting Ang to hesitate realizing he may have said too much. Their conversation is abruptly interrupted by a creepy voice from above, exclaiming, Found you. Fear grips both Lu and Ang as they look up to see two demons perched on a tree, giggling and claiming to have found the human. The demons remark that Ang smells like them. Lu, filled with terror, spots the two fin demons, while Ang curses internally, wondering why two one-fin demons appeared simultaneously. Aware that they would be overpowered in a fight against the demons, alarms sound, and lights activate in the city. The three squad leaders, accompanied by the two NPCs, appear behind them. Joel informs everyone that signs of one fin demons have appeared, instructing them to scan the area with spotlights. The two NPCs agree, shouting affirmatively. Jell asks Jean why one fin demons have emerged and speculates if it's the same one from the assessment. Jean assures her that he found the demon in an underground cave and is certain it was dead. Spotlights begin scanning the decaying forest, revealing the presence of the demons in the same area as Ang and Lu. The NPCs alert the captains that two one-fin demons have been spotted. Joel calms everyone down, ordering the city gates to be shut and the defensive turrets to be prepared. He ponders what might have attracted two demons to appear simultaneously. The defensive turrets are activated and begin charging up. However, someone shouts to hold on and not to close the gates. Jell is surprised to hear this from Jean, who explains that there is someone out there. Joel calls for spotlights to be directed toward the source of Jin's concern, revealing Ang and Lu in the same area as the two one fin demons. Jell asked why they were outside the city at night, but none of the captains had any idea. As they surveyed the area, they noticed three captured demons. Jean closed his eyes, finally understanding why they were outside the city. He explained to the others that Ang and Lu wanted to capture demons at night because their progress was hindered earlier in the day. Joel added that their talent and reckless desire for good performance had caused this problem, something common among rookie warriors. Jean hyped himself up, covering his body in a red aura, preparing to jump. He exclaimed that Ang and Lu would receive the worst punishment when they returned. Jin's powerful leap created a shockwave, pushing everyone back. Jell called out to him and turned to Joel, informing him that she would go with Jean for the rescue and leave the command to him. Confused by her upside-down jump, Joel shrugged it off, knowing he wasn't the writer. Jean and Jell leaped from the top of the wall, with Joel watching from above, realizing that a rare night of drinking had been ruined. He saw the intense impact of their landing and their dash forward. One of the one fin demons noticed the captains approaching. Ang told Lu to hide behind him, saying they needed to wait for help and stall for time. Ang wondered if the demons were here for him, just like the one fin demon from before. He questioned whether it was because of his rebirth or something that happened in the cave. Lu stepped up, suggesting they should fight together. The one fin demons opened its mouth in a creepy way, indicating a desire to fight back. 
Both demons leaped down from the tree, but one of them disappeared instantly before landing, while the other landed in front of Ang and Lu. Suddenly, a red demon appeared between Ang and Lu, raising its arm, threatening to kill the useless one and targeting Lu. However, Ang managed to body slam the red demon away from Lu's attack. The red demon strike destroyed the ground, sending shockwaves to Ang and Lu. The red demon praised Ang for his quick reflexes, while Lu readied herself and kicked the red demon's face, telling it to eat dirt. To her surprise, she realized her kick was held back by water strings, and the red demon taunted her. At that moment, the blue demon appeared, blocking Lu's kick with its water strings, and told her to look. The blue demon's strings wrapped around Lu's body effortlessly, causing her to scream in pain. Ang called out her name in concern, but before he could do anything, the red demon reappeared before him with its fist ready, admonishing him for being distracted. However, a heavy fist suddenly smashed into the red demon's face, giving it a shock. Jean appeared and sent the red demon flying, warning it not to even think of hurting the two young warriors. Jean and Jell appeared in front of Ang, surprising him, and reassured him that they were safe now. Jell examined the two demons and recognized them as a blue cord water type and a red cord earth type. She realized they needed to save Lu first. The blue core water type was agility based, while the red core earth type was strength based. The red demon remarked that it was lucky to block Jin's attack, or else its head would have exploded. Meanwhile, Joel noticed the situation and wondered if they were at a standstill. He yelled out that they were too close and commanded the defensive cannons to be ready, warning them to avoid harming their own people. Another warrior appeared, calling out to Joel. She informed him that they had detected a large number of no-fin demons heading in their direction. Joel asked how many, and she replied countless. Fear and sweat overcame her as she trembled, explaining that it was a demon wave. The red moon's glow covered the aura, and the ground shook heavily as endless streams of monsters emerged from the forest. The demons screamed and shouted as they rushed forward. Joel clenched his teeth and gave the command, sound the alarms. All warriors prepare for combat. The command echoed through the air as alarms and sirens blared throughout the city in response to the incoming demon wave. The warriors in the city rushed towards the walls, preparing to assemble in their squads. Jean took note of the demon wave, realizing that the demons were well prepared since they had made such a big move. Ang added that they had passed them and were heading straight for the city. Jell informed them that the demon wave had been called by the two demons emphasizing the need to eliminate them quickly. Lu shouted to them that she was fine and urged them to help the city instead, feeling like a burden and neglecting her duty. However, the blue demon covered her mouth, telling her to shut up, while she struggled to free herself. Determined, the three of them leaped towards the demons, with Jean leading the charge. He yelled out that they would bring Lu back with them. The red demon laughed like the Joker and slammed its hand into the ground, summoning two waves of large red spikes from the earth towards them. Jean warned Jell to watch out as the spikes approached. Jean and Jell dodged the spikes, while Ang effortlessly broke through them. Jean and Jell attempted to break the spikes, but Ang realized that they weren't attacking him. The red demon appeared beside Ang, suggesting they go. Ignoring Ang's presence, the red demon dashed towards Jean and Jell instead. Jean wondered why the red demon hadn't stopped on. As Jean and Jell fought the red demon, it warned them that spacing out would result in death. The blue demon tightly held onto Lu, urging on to follow. Suddenly, Lu was sent flying backward as a large stream of water carried her away from the group. Ang called out to her, but his strength was lacking, and he struggled to think clearly about the trap to separate him from the leaders. Jean saw Ang standing alone and shouted at him telling him not to follow the demon as he couldn't defeat it. However, Ang couldn't ignore Lu after witnessing the look in her eyes. He clenched his fist tightly, realizing he couldn't abandon her, and decided to follow her. Deep within the decaying forest where Lu was previously kidnapped by the blue demon, the blue demon suddenly stops running away and places Lu in front of itself. It stares intensely at Lu, creating a moment of artistic appreciation. Now, let's return to the story. 
the blue demon finds Lu intriguing and explains that one fin demons are interested in the rich emotions of humans. It had heard that humans scream when they feel despair. Beg, the blue demon demands, wanting to hear Lu plead for mercy. However, Lu remains silent, staring back at the demon. Perhaps it's because there is tape covering her mouth. Lu manages to remove the sticky blue substance from her face, revealing that her mouth was covered and making it impossible for her to scream. The blue demon then orders her to scream, but Lu remains defiantly silent. The demon wonders if Lu was even worthy of begging for her life. Lu, unyielding, tells the demon that she belongs to a martial family that taught her never to bow her head before an enemy. Cowardice is considered shameful in her family, so she challenges the demon to either kill her or face her in combat once again. The demon remains silent for a moment, processing Lu's words, but then bursts into laughter. It kicks her in the face, expressing its anger. It taunts Lu, claiming that she was merely bait and will soon meet her demise on the ground. But Lu, displaying the utmost confidence, gives the demon a powerful side eye. Just as the blue demon approaches Lu with malicious intent, a voice calls out, breaking the tense atmosphere. On the piers, wielding his knife and pointing it at the demon, demanding that it release Lu and acknowledging himself as their target. Lu looks at Ang, puzzled by why he came alone. The blue demon rejoices at the sight of Ang, realizing that their trap has worked, and that he was the true target all along. Lu wonders about the demon's claim regarding Ang being the target. Ang prepares himself with his knife and asks Lu if she is all right. She assures him that she is fine but urges him to leave, recognizing that he cannot defeat the demon on his own. In a fit of anger, the blue demon kicks Lu in the stomach, criticizing her for being noisy. Ang's anger intensifies as he pleads with the demon to spare Lu and offers himself as a substitute. However, the demon dismisses Ang's words with a giggle. Suddenly, a rapid stream of blue water propels itself toward Ang. The blue demon, once again in front of Ang, warns him that both of them will meet their demise. Ang attempts to slice the demon with his knife, but the demon swiftly evades the attack. It retaliates with a powerful punch, which Ang manages to block with his left arm. Realizing his body is unable to keep up with the demon's swift movements, Ang ponders whether the demon is of a water type. He contemplates the evolution of demons over the decades and their acquisition of new attributes. Aang's body begins to bleed as more cuts appear, making him realize that his current physical techniques are insufficient. He acknowledges that both he and Lu are in danger of losing their lives. Meanwhile, as Lu lies on the ground, she wonders why Aang came alone, knowing that he is no match for a one-fin demon. Her attention is drawn to a sharp spike on the ground in front of her. Determined not to remain idle, she moves closer to the spike, understanding that she cannot sit still and do nothing. Taking advantage of Aang's arm blocking the blue demon's attack, he recognizes it as a chance and swings his knife with intense power. However, the blue demon captures the blade with its watery form, mocking Aang for supposedly killing the one fin demon in the cave. Aang vehemently denies any knowledge of such an event but the demon scorns his attitude and decides he must be punished. Gripping both of Aang's arms, the demon twists them in various directions, breaking the bones. Aang's agonizing screams echo throughout the forest. Holding Aang in the air, the demon accuses him of dishonesty and delivers a brutal knee strike to his stomach, further inflicting harm. The force of the kick sends Aang flying backward. The demon demands that Ang reveal his secret but finds him lying motionless on the ground, believing that its kick has disemboweled him. Ang contemplates his own frailty, realizing that he couldn't even defeat a one-fin demon despite falling in slow motion. Meanwhile, Lu notices that Ang is in grave danger and takes action to free herself, even resorting to cutting her own wrists to make them bleed. As the demon advances toward Ang, threatening to devour him for not admitting his secret, it licks its lips, anticipating that consuming Ang will lead to its own evolution. Just as the demon reaches for Ang, a blade materializes behind its head. The demon swiftly dodges the blade as Lu appears behind it, catching the blue demon off guard. With a swift motion, 
she lands a kick on its chest, followed by another, flipping backward forcefully and sending the blue demon flying away from Meng Lu skillfully lands on her feet, her eyes now glowing a bright green. She warns the demon not to dare to harm her squad member. Surprised by Lu's escape from its binds, the blue demon addresses her, acknowledging her determination and the blood on her ankles and wrists as a testament to her ruthless escape. Lu boldly tells the demon that if it wants to kill one of her squad members, it should start with the captain, who is her. The demon responds by releasing water from its body, shaping it into numerous blades. It warns Lu not to dodge the water blades, and they begin to approach her. Lu, exerting all her strength, does her best to deflect the attacks directed at her and Ang Ang whispers to her, advising her to dodge instead of deflect. However, Lu insists that if she dodges, Ang will be struck. She realizes that the number of attacks is overwhelming. As the demon raises its hand toward Lu and Ang, water blades rise from the ground around Lu's feet, attacking her from behind. Lu screams in pain. The demon withdraws its hand, causing Lu to be flung straight toward it, beckoning her to come closer. It grabs Lu by the throat holding her high in the air, relishing the prospect of humiliating her instead of ending her life in battle. Its teeth are visible as it sadistically informs Lu that soon she will be screaming to the fullest extent. The bluefin demon grabs tightly onto Lu's neck asking her if she wanted to die in battle. It raises her up high in the air, telling her that it won't kill her but instead wanted to humiliate her. The bluefin demon gives a grin as it tells Lu that she will be screaming soon enough. Am could barely keep his eyes open as he watches the bluefin demon holding onto Lu far away from him. He thinks about Lu and how he wanted the bluefin demon to let her go. His hand trembles as he tried his best to stand up but couldn't, his thoughts were in a mess as he thinks that it was a shame that he was reborn just to watch his teammate die in front of him, Ang realized that nothing had changed at all and that as the once strongest warrior, he needed to rely upon a young lady to protect him in the end. He continues to think of himself as useless due to the fact that he couldn't even protect himself and much less anyone else, the red core on his chest started to crack and pieces of it fell out. Ang's aura started to unleash in heavy waves from his body, his eyes glowed red with fury as he thinks about being allowed to be spared from the agony of watching another teammate die before him, he shouts in his mind that there was nothing he can do. Ang's furious aura was powerful enough to catch the bluefin demon's attention. It turned around to see what the cause of the powerful aura was. But multiple shrieks of red deadly aura went past it, Lu had vanished from the bluefin demon's claws. Ang had managed to instantly save Lu from the bluefin demon's claws by surprise. Wounds appear on its claws as it realized that Ang didn't attack it at all and wonders if the injuries were from just the wind pressure alone. Ang looks at the heavily wounded Lu and tells her that she had done a great job on her first time as a leader but Lu asks him if he was really on. As Ang's face was revealed to be showing a bright glowing red eye, he tells her to leave the rest to him. Ang places Lu onto the ground gently to allow her to recover from her wounds as the demon stares at them. It spoke out telling Ang that he really smelled like the demons and that he was really so strong, the demon was happy to see that Ang actually had a secret. Ang then turns around and began to walk to the bluefin demon, he tells it that he doesn't know what happened exactly. Ang starts to notice that there seems to be power surging from out of his chest and that it was shooting upwards. He closes his eyes as a red line appeared near his eyes thinking that the power felt like it was going to pierce through his body. But he suddenly screams out loud, unleashing a devastating red aura as if it was death itself. Changes started to flow into the red core on Ang's chest. Till it transforms itself into a white core with a black symbol on it. The blue fin demon recognizes the white core as the king fin's core, it was shocked and alarmed to see that it resided on Aang's chest. Lu was still heavily injured but could sense something coming from Aang. She looks at Aang and sees his body covered by the red aura. Aang slowly walks to the blue fin demon, telling it that he knew something. And that the something was the fact that the blue fin demon was going to die. Aang had awakened his one fin form as a single horn appeared on his head back to the captains Jean and Jell who were fighting against the red fin demon. It soon senses a powerful aura that was felt by its entire body. The red fin demon then looks in the direction where Ang was and realizes that one of its kind had a strong aura that was enough to cause its head to spin, 
Genie appears close to the red fin demon as its attention was distracted for a moment due to the powerful aura. He readies his fist and tells the demon to not get distracted. Before punching the red fin demon right in its chest with a heavy blow, the force of Jin's punch could be felt immensely as it caused a shockwave to erupt from the demon's back. Jell then appears from the air after leaping forward with her legs bent back. She drops kicks the red fin demon straight in its face as if this was the WWE. Her drop kick sends it flying toward the dead trees in the forest. But her attack doesn't stop and she leaps forward to where the red fin demon was with an intense blue aura in her eyes. The red fin demon tried to steady itself from their combined attack and realized how they were so strong and that it could not defend itself properly. Jean and Jell appear suddenly right in front of the red fin demon catching it off guard. With a combination of attacks from Jin's fist and Jell's kick to the stomach of the red fin demon, a red glowing ball of light appeared from its back, which soon erupts into a powerful deadly laser beam attack, causing a hole to appear on the red fin demon's body, as if Cyclops from XMEN attacked the demon himself. Jin's and Jell's attacks had sent the red fin demon into midair. It looks at the gaping hole in its body and curses at them for daring to open a hole on its body. The red fin demon then decides to go out with a bang like it's the 4th of July by using its red core. Jell sees the bright red light coming from its body and realizes that it was going to self-destruct. She runs over to cover Jean from its explosion but Jean tells her to let him protect her instead. The red fin demon's body started to glow bright red as it tells Jean and Jell that they should die together. But before it could explode something fast and yellow pierces the red fin demon's arm and into its side causing the red fin demon to travel a great distance away from Jean and Jell. A large metallic spear or arrow was seen to have pierced the red fin demon before it could explode, the red fin demon cursed damned humans before drawing its last breath. Both Jean and Jell were got off guard in seeing what had happened to the red fin demon. Jell then realizes that it was due to the defensive artillery as she looks back at the city where numerous warriors were seen battling an endless horde of demons right outside the gates of the city. Joel was dashing and cutting through the demons with his blade as they were trying to climb the city's walls. He comes to a screeching stop before seeing a huge crowd of demons all reaching up to climb the walls. He looks at the demons with a nervous expression on his face as he knew that there were too many demons to kill. He proceeds to shout out a command, telling everyone to return to the city as the demon wave was approaching. He yells out loud for Tang Tang and Jell to return as well. Jell informs Jean that they needed to return to the city as its citizens needed them. But Jean turns away from the city as he thought of Ong and Lu needing him more. But Jell tells him that she felt just as bad as him and that they weren't just squadron leaders. But warriors, GYAT damn am I right everyone Emma leave this scene in here for everyone to enjoy before we get back to the story, comment below if this was the best part. Jean closes his eyes in pain as he realized that what Jell said was true. He then yells out to go. Support the city. As they both rush to help the city from the demon wave. The blue fin demon's voice could be heard deep within the forest asking why a human was the same as a demon. Lu is fully unconscious on the ground as the blue fin demon trembles over in fear at the sight of Ang as he walked closer to it. The blue fin demon then tells him that something was not right and wonders if Ang was truly stronger and why there was a fin growing out of a human. But Ang didn't reply and simply stared at him with his yellowish eye and horn growing out of his forehead. He then tells it that maybe this was the reason for his reincarnation, the fact that he was given this demonic power to change everything, as he points a finger upwards which cast a green light. He then flicks the green light backward, which seems to head straight toward Lu who was on the ground. The green light started to spread itself over Lu. It slowly started to remove the injuries and heal Lu back up. The blue fin demon was surprised to see that Ang could heal someone and wondered if he was a wood type. Ang tells the blue fin demon that he could vaguely recall what had happened, as memories of when the king fin demon took over Ang's body during the time at the cave flashed through his mind. Ang then tells it that he may have absorbed the wood type power from the one fin demon back then. Tree branches soon appeared from below the ground and started to circle around Ang as he tells the blue fin demon that if he absorbs it, maybe he would get the power of water. The tree branches soon combined into one another and cast a huge shadow over the bluefin demon, it yells out what is this power. 
I've never seen it. Never seen it. Ang was T posing over the bluefin demon as he stood over it on top of a wooden structure he had created. Ang proceeds to tell the bluefin demon that he was excited to see the extent of the demonic power with his hand fully changed into a red demonic skin tone with black nails. Ang continued to stand on top of his wooden structure as he exudes a deadly red aura into the bright moon night. The bluefin demon trembled in fear at the fact that Ang could absorb the abilities of a onefin demon's core and that he had turned into a demon himself. Ang smirks at the fact that it was interesting for him to see a demon trembling with such intense fear as before in his past life he had never seen such a thing. Ang proceeds to stomp his feet hard onto the wood. Before diving head first towards the bluefin demon as it trembles in fear of what Ang had become. With a smile on his face, Ang tells the bluefin demon straight to its face to hit him with all that it got, this catches the bluefin demon off guard. Ang tells it that he just wanted to see how strong he was in this form, agreeing to his request, the bluefin demon started to cast its ability while asking Ang what he was and whether he was human. Or demon. It shouts as it attempts to hit Ang, but Ang leaps backward and easily dodges its attacks. Ang backs away from the bluefin demon and glossed over the fact that it could manipulate elements. He then stretches his demonic hand forward, telling it that he had recalled that the wood-type demon he absorbed had a certain skill. A certain green aura started to appear on his demon hand as he crunched his fingers together. Tree branches soon erupted from the ground below where the bluefin demon was standing at. The branches soon reached its face and slowly crept around it. The tree branches then tightened themselves around the arms legs and neck of the bluefin demon while raising it into the air and off the ground. Ang proceeds to cross his arms together while still using the wood-type powers. He smirks and clenches his fists tight together saying that this doesn't seem hard at all. The bluefin demon tried to reach out with its claws and said that it was getting strangled. It screams out in pain as Ang watches from afar, telling it to go on and struggle. The bluefin demon started to gasp for air and muttered that it needed to use its trump card, just as the water started to leak from its body. The bluefin demon soon disappeared from the clutches of Ang's wood powers as large torrents of water are seen heading towards him. The bluefin demon had used his trump called Disintegrate. Ang gazes at what just happened and remains silent. He jumps back from where he previously stood just as the large torrents of water slam the ground, causing cracks to appear everywhere. But the bluefin demon appears right in front of Ang with its body made of half water just as Ang was retreating backward. The bluefin demon's giggles and tells Ang that it was not enough and reaches towards him with its massive clawed hand. It tells Ang that he couldn't kill it and grabs onto Ang's arm as he tries to defend himself. Its clawed hand grips hard onto Ang's arm and tells him that he was a wood type. And that he couldn't disintegrate like it could, before ripping Ang's arm away from his body in a swift motion. Ang continues to remain silent even after having his arm ripped out, he continues to block the incoming attacks of the bluefin demon as it laughs in Ang's face telling him that the demonic power was something a human could never understand. The bluefin demon was finally able to land a hit on Ang as it kicks him right in the stomach, screaming out that it was stronger than Ang. The deadly kick sent Ang flying and crashing into numerous trees in the forest. But Ang was smiling even after having his arm ripped and being kicked in the stomach. As he flies through the air due to the power of the kick, time seemed to stop for a moment. A giant hand made of wood soon appeared behind Ang, catching him in the air and stopping him from flying back any further. Ang then stood up and started to walk towards the bluefin demon, telling it that it was right about how he did not know how strong the demonic power was yet. Ang then looks up and asks the bluefin demon if it knew that Ang was the strongest warrior and that he was good at learning new things. Ang proceeds to tell the bluefin demon that all he needed to do to kill is to learn and familiarize himself with demonic power non-stop, just as his wood-type power seemed to heal and create a new arm as if he was the one fin demon that took him to the cave. The bluefin demon was shocked to learn that Ang had figured out how to do wood-type self-regeneration in an instant. Ang then shows off his new arm to the bluefin demon telling it to look and that he did just as he told it, about the fact that Ang was good at learning new things. Ang then takes a heavy stomp onto the ground, before placing himself into a runner starting position stance. He dashes forward with insane speed and with murder in his eyes. As he continued to run toward the bluefin demon, 
a tree branch appeared right below his foot and lifted it. Am um jumps off of it to gain speed, and continued to do the same as he propelled himself forward with greater speed with the help of the wood power. The blue fin demon was alarmed to see that Ang was already right in front of it. It tries its best to back away from Ang, but something went wrong. It looked at its foot and realized that it was tangled with Ang's tree branch skill, which came sneakily from the ground below it. Ang's hands soon appeared on the blue fin demon's face. He grips it hard onto it, causing the blue fin demon to scream in fear as his body releases a deadly red aura all around. Ang looks at the blue fin demon's face with a smirk, shh, he said, Don't run away. With the tree branches erupting from the ground to lift Ang up, he now stood over the blue fin demon causing it to kneel before Ang as he holds its face close to his. Cracks started to appear on the bluefin demon's face as Ang told it that he was getting bored of their fight. The bluefin demon screams out about its insides just as bright green bubbles started to appear all over it. Ang continues to hold on tight to the bluefin demon's face as it screams out in pain with green lights appearing out of its body. A green explosion was soon seen just like the ability of Lu. Ang stood still with his body and skate from the explosion but the bluefin demon was no longer present, shards of blue color were then seen floating in the air. A piece of the blue shard behind Ang soon started to leak water. Water started to flow around a blue core in the air. The bluefin demon had reappeared once more, calling Ang stupid and laughing at the fact that it could disintegrate its body just as it launches another attack at Ang from the back. But spikes soon appeared from below the ground piercing through the bluefin demon's body in many places, stopping its attack from ever reaching Ang in the first place. Ang turns around and tells it that he knew about it and that its core which was vital to demons was not able to disintegrate itself. Ang carries himself over to the bluefin demon with his tree branches, calling it a stupid thing and that it had overestimated itself. The bluefin demon tried its best to reach out to its blue core that was exposed due to Ang's tree branches but Ang grabs it right in front of its face. Ang informs the bluefin demon that once a demon's core is destroyed, even a seven-fin demon would die much less you. He grins with an evil smile and tells the bluefin demon that he was going to be taking its watertight powers. The bluefin demon soon met its demise as its body slumped over motionless. Its body soon began to turn into water. And water soon flowed down the spikes and onto the ground. Ang stood victoriously while holding the blue core into the air as the red moon shined brightly in front of him. He then smashes the blue core into pieces and proceeds to drink the water that came out of it, while laughing like an evil maniac. He tells it to make him stronger. Demonic thoughts were invading Ang's psyche. Thanks for watching the latest part from the voice of Manwa. Subscribe for more content and don't forget to comment below what you want to see in the future. Like and share for more.